This video is made possible by Brilliant. Roombas are an amazing convenience. They're probably the closest thing that we've gotten to Rosie from the Jetsons. I may be homely, Buster, but I'm S-M-A-R-T smart. It will clean your home while you're asleep or you're away, and sometimes it does it with a little bit of attitude. But like all smart home technologies such as Alexa or Nest, Roombas are taking in information about you and your home. It uses this data to perform its tasks more efficiently and with more precision and versatility. This data is also useful for a lot of other things too, some directly related to its daily tasks and others not. These days, Roombas are equipped with a combination of sensor types, Archon or room confinement sensors, cliff sensors, optical sensors, proximity sensors, and last but not least, video cameras. While roaming and taking in all the information it gathers through these inputs, the device connects to your Wi-Fi to process and store the information in the cloud. You can also use the Wi-Fi connection to control it from your phone or with other smart devices like Google Assistant or Alexa. If your home is equipped with one of these devices, you can say something like, Hey Alexa, clean in front of the sofa. And Roomba will head over to your sofa in search of a mess to clean. But how does it know how to do that? And how does it even know what a sofa is? Well, one of the first thing a Roomba does once it sets loose in your home is to create what's it called a smart map. The device gathers information about the shape and layout of your home after moving in a predetermined algorithm. This makes sure that it sees everything and can make a full 3D scan of your house. Once it's done, you can view this smart map on the accompanying app and label rooms accordingly. It then uses this information to optimize its cleaning paths and to give you a level of control in the areas that it will cover. But that's not all. The process also employs a machine vision algorithm to identify specific pieces of furniture in your house, like couches, tables, and kitchen counters. As a robot logs all of these objects, it'll make suggestions to the user to add them to its internal map as clean zones or specific areas of your house that you can direct the Roomba to clean. Machine vision is a technique for allowing a computer to automatically learn from images to identify objects without programming it explicitly for the task. So instead of telling the computer, this is what defines a chair, you say, hey, here's 10,000s of images of chairs, try to know it when you see it again. In the case of the Roomba, these tens of thousands of images came from employee volunteers that consented to having their homes cataloged. The images were then painstakingly combed over by humans who labeled and defined elements inside of the photos. Roomba also has recently tackled the poo problem using this system. Where earlier versions wouldn't recognize pet or human poo for obstacles to avoid, it would just kind of smear it around, the home intelligence system was trained on many, many thousands of Play-Doh poop mock-ups in order to recognize an incoming potential disaster. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, the technique of training computers to mimic human cognition. With the poo problem, the Roomba looks at each pixel of the image, its colors and relationship to adjacent pixels, and determines the likelihood that the object in front of it is in the poo category of objects. The problem is that this process requires a lot of data to start with. While employees joke around about all the Play-Doh poo that they created, that's the reality of creating data sets that artificial intelligence can be based on. This is really the most important ingredient. Artificial intelligence is only as smart as the data that it's been trained on. While Roomba's training comes from the employee's domestic environments, the real power of systems like these comes from much larger and much more diverse sample sizes. These can only be obtained by gathering information out in the wild. The customer base of Roomba is many times larger than the employee base. A Reuters article of an interview with iRobot's CEO, Colin Engel, identified the power that this kind of data can yield for a company like theirs. That data is of the spatial variety, the dimensions of a room, as well as distances between sofas, tables, lamps, and other home furnishings. To a tech industry eager to push smart homes controlled by a variety of internet-enabled devices, that space is the next frontier. The CEO claimed it shares maps for free with customer consent. And that led to a bit of a security scare when announced. Then iRobot then released a response assuring its customers it doesn't keep images of their home or that it quickly converts image data to a set of abstract relationships. But it is ultimately still spatial data about the home. The Reuters article and the subsequent New York Times article identifies the opportunities for companies to be able to sell more home goods through these targeted relationships, but my interests are more architectural. In fields adjacent to architecture, artificial intelligence is being deployed in a host of ways based on the availability of datasets like these. But in other fields, this data is a little bit easier to come by. 
For instance, in cities, live camera feeds of traffic, Google Street View, or Tesla cameras are all able to capture vast amounts of information that is used to train artificial intelligence to become partners in optimizing urban configurations. In real estate, AI is being used by companies like Open Door in the residential sector and WeWork in the commercial sector. Open Door's artificial intelligence operates on the pricing of homes so the company can buy homes using cash and then resell them at a profit. It's able to do this because it has access to vast amounts of data collected through the real estate industry. WeWork will rate office rental locations based on proximity to amenities and business, then passes data off to real estate teams that will have the final say on where these new buildings could be established. For interiors, they feed information about the layout of current locations, of office size, number of rooms, etc., and utilization of these rooms in order to understand if there's a relationship. Over time, the company has used their algorithm to predict which types of room might be used more or less than others, and then incorporates this information into the design process of new buildings. As WeWork continues to open more buildings, the algorithm will become stronger and allow the company to create space that will completely satisfy future demand. Or even companies like Google are large enough to track all kinds of data with its millions of square feet of office space. And it uses artificial intelligence to determine best practice for utilizing their spaces efficiently and ways to maximize employee satisfaction. But for most of architectural and interior design, there's a distinct lack of data to use to train artificial intelligence. There's a number of reasons for this. Firstly, it has to do with the protective nature of architects and designers that are unwilling to share their work. Or secondly, a lot of buildings are simply private and owners really don't want their information shared. If you look at it in these terms, there's another company that ends up with a similar set of spatial data, and that's Matterport. Matterport is a 3D data platform. They call it the standard for 3D space capture. They sell cameras and services which collect images of interiors and map them in 3D space for various uses like virtual real estate tours and a host of other things. They claim to have data for 15 billion square feet of space, and this is growing all the time. They just acquired VHT, one of their primary competitors, and they also recently acquired Enview, a company that uses artificial intelligence to analyze 3D spatial data. Enview claims everything you want to know about the world should be at your fingertips. No waiting, no scale limits, and no manual work. But for now, Matterport offices like things like dollhouse views or 3D floor plan perspectives that resemble a dollhouse, which are fully interactive and photorealistic, you can measure on these things. Once you have all the data of the 3D model, you can use the measurement mode to accurately measure anything inside of it. Or then there's Matterpack, which allows you to download, import, or even edit digital data sets from the Matterport cloud. While these services benefit the customers directly, just like Roomba, they see the data collection and control as their primary value. They say, once these essential tools are public, we will begin seeing amazing possibilities become reality in ways that we have imagined and cannot yet even imagine. All because of the data that Matterport camera captures. That data is truly the magic of Matterport. They call the process of translating the real world into data, datafication. And once that's achieved, the decision of what to do with it is open-ended. They claim together we can deliver breakthrough building analysis and data insights to our customers, including automated building inspections, AI-powered space planning, and property utilization analysis to deliver operating efficiencies in a completely digital environment. These spatial scans of interiors are the platforms that will train the AI for architecture. But of course, there are all kinds of ethical questions surrounding these sources. Who owns them? And what are the biases of this kind of data? Majority of the recent advances in artificial intelligent image creation platforms like Midjourney or DALI which can create new images or verbal descriptions, we're all trained with this commonly used data set that's called ImageNet. ImageNet contains over a million images with labels and bounding boxes. Each image in the data set is annotated by humans and is quality controlled. This is obviously no small feat. It requires a vast amount of human resources to create these kind of data sets. And this is where Roomba's and Matterport's data becomes so valuable. They have exclusive access to the interior of your home with a roaming camera that's trained to identify and understand its arrangement. This data is invaluable and can be used for all sorts of things. Obviously, Amazon might want it to identify products missing from your home that it could sell you to fill out your collection. But on the flip side, there are also cultural producers and scientists looking to know more about how we use and design the built environment. And I can't think of any other way to make this information available to the greater good. In the meantime, there are architects exploring these tools for their design potentials. 
People like Matias Del Campo at the University of Michigan have been experimenting with artificial intelligence for a while now. You need to have data in order to be able to create a network that understands what it means to optimize a room size. Where does the data come from? Who owns that data? He's even writing a book and collecting some of the best examples of AI-generated dreamlike building images. But the data set those platforms are built on aren't particularly architectural in nature. It's ImageNet. And Campo is working to build a data set for architectural uses. The goal of this project is the creation of a crucial building block of the research on AI and architecture, a database of 3D models necessary to successfully run artificial neural networks in 3D. So all sorts of companies and researchers are clamoring for the spatial data sets produced by the likes of Roomba and Matterport. Like any other data collected about you, it's fraught with all sorts of issues, yet at the same time represents the future of computational design and hopefully lead to a better designed world. This video about 3D data and AI would not have been possible without Brilliant. Brilliant is a learning experience that teaches you and challenges you with progressive and interactive programs, puzzles, and other kinds of exchanges that make learning feel more like entertainment. I was just doing a puzzle that let me learn and explore the behavior of neural networks. The puzzle would challenge me to test whether a cat would be pleased based on certain neural network wirings. The cat Lester was just like mine, who didn't like his ears rubbed. But things got more complex, and I found myself playing with the puzzle just to see how the cat would respond. To that end, Brilliant has lessons for everyone. You don't have to be an architecture professor like me. There are life-applicable topics to match your curiosity, and Brilliant offers a community to help inspire and keep you excited about learning. And look, I am not a puzzler at all. I don't even have a single game on my phone. Instead, what I'll do is I'll start a lesson with Brilliant on my computer on a lunch break, but then pick up where I left off on my phone while I'm waiting somewhere else. And you can too with a deal that we worked out together. For the first 200 people to click on the link in the description, brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks, they'll get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So let's get started playing and learning with Brilliant today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We will reward you with thought-provoking videos on the built environment dropped every other week on Thursdays. And until the next one, check out some of these other videos while you're waiting around. See you over there.